we're looking for when we're looking at coaching young players is we want to find the most effective, efficient and functional way to help people develop. That might look different in this situation than in this situation. It might look different in this club than in this club based on the players that are in front of us. So the first thing I'd like you to take away is that there's no one way of doing any of this. But the way that we coach young players should be built on solid principles that make it effective and efficient. So the answer to nearly every question in this domain is it depends. It depends on what I want to do, how, what I want to develop, and the type of players that I have in front of me. So you might be familiar with the saying, a smooth sea never made a skilled sailor. But what do I mean by the role of challenge in terms of talent development and in terms of coaching young players? And often when we were working with young players, we're really motivated to give them everything, to give them really clear directions so that they can do things quickly, give them game plans that they can follow to win a match, and give them as many resources and opportunities as possible so they get to the destination quickly. This smoothing of the pathway, kind of snow plowing like in this picture, all challenges away from young players, is further compounded because actually the very best young players that we work with don't actually encounter very many challenges at all on the pathway. Often the best young players are physically mature, they're technically good, they're tactically good, and they get away with that natural ability until very long um, down the road of being a footballer or a hurler. So this presents a potential conundrum. If we know that, that players at the senior level need to be resilient, robust, have confidence in their abilities, and have the grit and determination to succeed, how can they develop those sort of characteristics if we take all the challenges away from them on the way up? So one of the things that we know is that an overly smooth pathway presents a really uh, non-effective way to develop young players. But as a parent, I can really understand that approach. When I'm, when I'm with my kids, I want to do the best for them. I want to give them as much things as possible because I want them to be successful. If I'm an underage coach, maybe I do that as well. Because if I do things for the kids, give them the solutions, give them the team plan and play in a certain way, we're successful at under 12 or under 14 or minor level. But actually, am I neglecting, the, am I neglecting to give those players the opportunity to develop those psychological skills? So what we'll talk about now is what's that role of challenge? How as coaches can we challenge young players on our pathways to develop the skills that they'll need for tomorrow? Like many people here, I have a long-term talent development project at home. Her name is Shifra, and she's five years of age. Right? She's clearly hedging her bets in terms of what she's going to play when she's older. But as a parent and as a coach and as a practitioner, what I want to do is provide my kids with the best developmental opportunities possible in order that they achieve their aims. So in order to do that, colleagues and I have conducted a study. And the study that we did was called Super Champions, Champions and Almosts. And during the study, what we were interested in is we were interested in the experiences the best, young player, the best players in the world have when they're at junior level. So what we did is we recruited three groups of players. We recruited a group of super champions. So super champions were the best of the best in the world. They typically had things like 60 or more international caps if they were a team sport player, or they had five or more world-class medals as an individual player. I guess in GA terms, they're your Henry Shefflins, the very best of, that your game offers. And what we would then do is we would group them with a group of players that we call champions. Champions had less than one, less than one international medal at World or Olympic standard, and they had less than three international caps, but they were really established elite players. Premiership footballers, Heineken Cup rugby players, GA terms, they were established inter-county players. And what we did then is we grouped them to another group of athletes that we called the almosts. And the almosts were the underage stars. A lot of them had played international underage for their country or had been in, on professional contracts as a, as a youth, but then went on to compete at no higher than semi-pro or division two level as an adult. In GA terms, the kid who was a good inter-county minor but only went on to play for their club team as an adult. And what we were interested in is looking at comparing and contrasting the experiences of those three groups of players as they move through the pathway. So we got them to reflect back on their careers and tell us what happened, what were the critical episodes that occurred, what were the things that, that, ha that happened to you and the people that surrounded you that helped you get to where you are. And we came up with some really interesting results. 
So the first thing that we saw was that the super champs, the very best athletes in the world, showed us a really slow and bumpy progression. When they talked about their early involvement in sport, it could be kind of typified as they were there or thereabouts. They weren't the star of the team, but they told us about a, a number of kind of challenges and setbacks that they encountered along the way. Interestingly, most of those challenges weren't massive big life events. They, they didn't like lose a parent or were very sick or in significant accidents as a kid. But they told us about lots of different ups and downs on their pathway, getting dropped from a team, not getting selected, finding certain skills difficult, uh, being bullied at school, loads of things that happened within and outside their career that helped them develop the psychological skills that they needed to have as an adult. As a result of those challenges, they talked to us about how they developed resilience, coping skills, determination, motivation, um, belief in their own ability and planning skills that they used from those episodes on the way up to help them succeed and stay there as, a, as an elite performer. The really interesting thing about it was that actually when they talked to us about the challenges, they didn't really talk, talk about these challenges as setbacks, but they talked about how they used those challenges as growth experiences, things and ways that they could learn to get better. In fact, the, the super champs, even when things were going really well, tried to make things difficult for themselves. They joined teams where they knew they could be challenged. So they tried to work with coaches where they knew they would be challenged with. They tried new skills. So what typified the super champs in this study was their engagement with challenge and how much they learned from it. On the other hand, we got the almosts, the kids that were superstars underage but never went on to fulfill that potential at a senior level. And almost to the, to the athlete, they described a really nice, smooth, upwardly mobile trajectory as a kid. Uh, he was a great minor. He was the star of the minor team. Things came easily to, to me. I didn't really have to work hard. One of the participants in the study was a multiple world um, athletic uh, sprinting champion. And asked, when he was asked, tell us about your training during that stage, he just said, I wasn't really training. I was just quick, fast, and more mature than everyone else. It just came easy. He never m matched those junior performances at senior levels. In fact, they almost, when things went wrong for them, blamed other people. Oh, it's not fair. That coach doesn't like me. It doesn't he doesn't know what he's looking for, that coach doesn't know how good, how good I am. So rather than using challenges as ways to get better, they almost use them as ways to blame other people. And I bet if you're sitting in the room coaching groups of players, you can put names to these groups of super champs and almosts as well. The second thing was the type of people that, were surround, that surrounded the super champs and almosts. So look at the second line. The super champs told us about, some, about their parents and the role of the parents in their development. And they talked about parents who were super interested in them, really motivated and really committed to, the, to their sporting um, uh, experience, but they were somewhat separated. They weren't super involved in them, they didn't coach them, they let them at it and kept things in perspective. I use the term, they had, par they had disinterested, interested parents. How did you do today? Did you win? Did you just play well? Dinner's on the table and you have to have your homework done before bedtime. So they were able to keep the perspective of their, their highly motivated athletes, they were able to keep things in balance by having a check and balances on all parts of their life. In contrast, they almost had parents that were super involved in their, in their pathway. They were really invested in their superstar kid, they really wanted them to do well, they were often coaching or part of the coaching team of that young player. And if they weren't, they were certainly in the ear of the coach. Why isn't Johnny playing? Why isn't Mary taking those frees? Why isn't she getting more pitch time? Again, if you're coaching underage teams, you can probably put names to some of those parents that are constantly in your face or in your ears about what's happening to their little player on the pitch. One of the interesting things, though, is that level of interest and the level of parental drive was really evident as long as the player was doing well. Once the young superstar started to fade off, parents and coaches dropped back and stopped that level of interest. On the other hand, the super champs had continuous um, involvement from coaches and parents, irrespective of their sporting success. So they were a constant in their lives. The third point in this study that's interesting for, for coaches is the, the nature of the coaching that super champs and champs and, excuse me, and almost got on the way up. The super champs had coaches that were really challenging, that set personal challenges for those players even when they were within a team, 
They had high expectations of behavior and really high personal standards. So they drove those players to be the best they could be, to fulfill their potential at the level that they were at. On the other hand, they almost talked about coaches who were really driven for them to do well, but for them to do well, and had less personal interest in their behavior and in their, in their future success. So for me, the, the moral of this, of this story for, for coaches in the room is that actually, if you're working with young players and your young player is sailing along without any bumps on the road, that's a really bad preparation for what's to come next. How are they going to have the chance to develop those psychological skills that will stand them in good stead for the transfer to senior or even for other aspects in their life that Laura will talk about later? if we don't give them an opportunity to overcome and deal with adversity and challenge on the way up. So what Laura's going to do now is talk a little bit around her own rocky road and the key factors that are important within that, within that domain. Hi, everyone. Um, I suppose my name is Laura Walsh, and I'm here today, I suppose, to try to compliment Anya and her content. So, uh, Anya, your content is excellent. Um, well done. <laughs> um, I suppose I have to... I've had a pretty rocky road, I suppose, when it does come to my sporting career, and uh, I'll just probably take you through kind of what it looked like for me. So from an early age, I suppose I was always uh, a massive sport nut. My dad often tells a story about me um, saying that he knew that there was probably something a bit different about me when he saw me running down the field, um, probably no more than two, kicking a football and not breaking stride as I did it. Um, now, I do question my dad's ability to remember things accurately, but at the same time, um, that is a scene that played out time and time again throughout my childhood. I constantly sought out sport. I constantly sought out challenge. Um, my teenage years, my early probably, um, you know, school years and teenage years were very convoluted with sport across a number of different domains. Um, now, South West Mead wouldn't be known for hurling or camogie, but uh, nonetheless, there was a team there, and I gave it a go probably up to about minor level. Um, I had a huge interest in basketball, and I played that across the board um, in secondary school, up the ranks through the Midlands Regional, and then played Super League at under-19 level as well. Um, at the age of seven, my mom decided it would be a great idea to put myself and my brother into gymnastics, and that's something I stuck at for about six years. And probably to this day, I probably attribute gymnastics to giving me a great foundation in terms of flexibility, core strength, and muscle, muscle conditioning at a young age that's probably led me to have quite a relatively injury-free career as well. Um, I had size nine feet growing up, so I had pretty impressive flippers, and I got into the water for two years swimming competitively with a swim team in Athlone. And uh, on my 16th birthday, my dad decided it would be a great idea to buy me a set of golf clubs and try push me that direction as well. So summer months were played... Uh, spent playing golf kind of during the daytime and trainings in the evenings. Um, obviously, I play Gaelic football as well at a, quite a high level too. Um, when we're speaking about the roles of parents, I suppose I was very blessed with uh, very supportive parents and patient parents, but mom and dad. They were very encouraging, but never overly pushy. Um, they never said no when I proposed joining a new sport or a new team. Um, and speaking with them last weekend, they said, you know, about today, when I was talking about today, they said that probably the biggest challenge was probably trying to find balance in my week between all the training sessions and all the teams that I was a part of. Um, so they really probably taught me how to regulate myself quite well as a youngster. Um, looking back now, I can see that those sampling years really set down a great foundation for um, some solid skill sets. Um, unknowns to myself at the time, as a youngster, I just wanted to play, I wanted to be competitive. I was very tough on myself, and I always wanted to do better at whatever sport I was playing at. Um, so unknowns to myself, I was constantly training, and if I wasn't training, I was playing, and if I wasn't playing, I was thinking about it, and if I wasn't thinking about it, I was probably watching it on telly. Um, but this constant repetition of playing and training, you know, put down this lovely foundation of transferable skills that allowed me to jump in between all these activities um, and also transfer them later on in life as well. Um, so grasping these fundamental movement patterns, you know, were very, um, it was a very important thing, I suppose, for me to do, but it was done probably secondary to why I was doing the activities in the first place. Um, at the age of 15, just short of my 16th birthday, I was invited into the senior setup at Westmead Ladies Football Team. Now, we're talking maybe about 18 years ago now. Um, I remember going to Crow Park uh, in and around that time and watching a player called Lisa Burke come off the bench for Westmead. Um, they were playing in a Division Two final, and Lisa was, you know, a kind of a, 
a prodigy within the county at the time, someone I really looked up to and admired. And I remember watching Lisa go out onto that field and thinking, well, that's what I want to do when I'm older. I want to step out onto Crow Park in my county, county colours. So um, the following season, I went in with Westmeath and uh, we were a Division Two team at the time. We were a senior team. Um, now, if you say the name of this presentation is the Rocky Road, you could say that Westmead probably fell into a bit of a pothole um, during those couple of years. Um, we had huge retirements of probably some very strong senior players within the dressing room. Um, probably structures within the county weren't there to really uh, engage success. Um, we didn't have a player pathway for girls really to be able to you know, um, progress onto the senior team. Um, and it was tough going. There were, there were times when uh, we might have 10 at training. There was times when you'd be ringing players on the way to a match, uh, trying to beg players to come out of work. Would they come for the match? Would pick your boots up on the way? It was, uh, it was definitely a testing time. But nonetheless, I suppose, my desire for Westmead, uh, or to play for Westmead, never wavered. It was something I was always hugely proud of, and I was always confident that, you know, if things took a turn for the better, that we were capable of competing at that level. And in and around probably 2006, we had a great new manager that went in by the name of Kenny McGinley, and he had come from the men's inter-county setup. He had experience at, uh, coaching at club level. And he, for us, for me, he was the catalyst to change within the county. He um, put pride back in the jersey. He was very clear in terms of his expectations about what was needed to commit, what commitment looked like. He emulated it, and he expected his players to do the same. Um, I suppose during those years between 2006 and 2011, we started, the ball started to roll and we started to pick up momentum a, a little bit. And in 2011, um, we probably had our breakthrough year. Um, that year we t had tumbled down to Division 4, but nonetheless, we won the Division 4 uh, league that year. We won the Intermediate Leinster Championship and then we went on to win the All-Ireland. Um, and so many people probably came up to me that year and said, geez, you really came from nowhere. Um, but, you know, for me, we hadn't come from nowhere. It was probably 11 years in the making at that, at that time. Um, so <clears throat> as success probably breeds success, um, within the county board, we now had structures in place where there was very clear uh, player pathways for young players to progress through their levels and through to the age groups. So by the time we had these really well-developed girls coming onto the senior team that were able to handle the pressures of senior football and compete at that level, and we were starting to see the fruits of the, um, I saw the, the foundations that the county board had put in. Um, after that, I suppose we progressed through to Division 3 and won the Division 3, went up into Division 2 where we sat for a couple of years. Um, then I suppose I took what I like to call a sab uh, sabbatical for uh, three years and um, I went into the Rugby Sevens program. I was, uh, I suppose I was approached through their talent identification program um, to see what I like to come on board and it's something that kind of completely took me out of the blue. I wasn't really expecting it, wasn't very familiar with the game itself to be honest. I went into it really actually with the opportunity to think that it will keep me fit during the off season for Gaelic but actually never saw progressing the way it did. Um, but um, the Rugby Sevens and saying that it was something that now I look back at and I know that probably my career up to that point had set me up nicely to be able to transfer into that program. I had a skill set that they felt that allowed me to transfer from playing high inter-county level sport over into you know, this high performance sport. Um, and so for that I felt as well that probably all the managing of my time and efforts that had gone in the last couple of years um, as an inter-county player again allowed me to succeed when I was playing the Rugby Sevens. It was a very intensive environment. Um, to give you an idea, I suppose, we would train three uh, five days a week, three times a day. The day would start at one o'clock, the girls would be in the gym. You might do a skill session in the afternoon. You might have some video analysis, um, some feedback, some physio, some rehab. Um, there was always plenty of things to do, and then you'd start your pitch session maybe at six o'clock and finish at just before eight. So you do three sessions within your day, five days a week. So for me, the, the ability to be able to self-regulate, to micromanage my time down to the hour was very, very important. I was a teacher at the time, and I was still trying to balance probably my working life with playing rugby sevens. Um, on top of that, I suppose as well, um, it allowed me to regulate my body. I was old enough to understand the importance of sleep and recovery and nutrition and all these things that probably, as a younger player going into the program, I probably wouldn't have appreciated as much. Um, I had a very strong sense of self, I suppose, at the age of 28 when I went in, and that allowed me to have some very kind of uh, honest conversations, I'd say, with management. If I didn't appreciate, you know, if something was done the way I felt it should be done, or decision making, anything like that, I was able to have these conversations that again, as a young player, I might not have been able to do. 
Um, on top of that, I was very confident in myself as a player. I would felt that my probably rocky road in sport, juggling all those sampling years, juggling all those sports, um, the rocky road with Westmead ladies probably up to that point had probably set me up nicely to be able to transfer into this high performance sport. Um, so then in 2016, I decided to return to the Westmead ladies. Uh, the girls had been knocking on the, the door in Division 2 at that stage. Um, and I was probably, after my sabbatical, as I say, I was probably rejuvenated, quite excited to go back into the team. Um, I'm very excited probably the prospect of maybe getting the team up to Division 1 based on the journey of where we'd come from in Division 4 a couple of years previous. Um, I suppose going back in, I was at 30 years of age and I was very thankful to be going back probably in better condition than most 30-year-olds would be at that stage. And um, I was quite rejuvenated about the prospect. I knew that my role within the team was very different probably at this stage and I knew that I was probably on my last legs as an inter-county footballer. So I was very much probably going in with a sense that, well, what legacy can I leave behind? Can I develop these young players? Can I impart some of my wisdom and knowledge onto them? And can I just leave something that's positive if I was to step aside in the future? Um, so thankfully, we got over the line in the Division Two final in 2017. And last year, Westmead ladies played up in Division One for the first time for as long as my sporting career I can remember. So it was, um, it was a big, I suppose, personal goal was achieved, but a goal within the county as well. Um, looking back now, I suppose, over the rocky road, um, it's not the wins and the losses that you reflect over. It's, I suppose, the overall journey. Was it full of humps and bumps and potholes along the way? It absolutely was. Um, but it's something I'm very proud of. I think that journey uh, built resilience, it built a determination, a bounce back ability. Uh, how do you react if things don't go your way? You roll up your sleeves and you, th you, know, you go again. So from that point of view, I'm very thankful for my rocky road as a player. That is it. So I suppose, Thinking about where Laura's come from on her rocky road, the next bit that we'd like to talk about is the role of competition in terms of how we support young players' development. And of course, competition is an absolute vital part of the development diet for any young player. After all, sport at its very essence is about winning and losing. But actually, a lot of the time in underage sport, we use competition in almost the exact same way as we do in adult sport. We use competition to figure out who's best on a given day, in a given season, in a given tournament. And although that might be the outcome of competition, it might not be the best function. If you think about the toilet roll slides, it not, might not be the best reason to use competition in terms of underage. Because of course, young players aren't adults. And the purpose of competition on the pathway might not be best thought of as an outcome-focused process, as finding out who's winning or losing. And we don't have to look too far for some evidence of this. So lots of people in the room will be familiar with the Tony Forrestal competition, the All-Ireland Under-14 Inter-County Tournament. And I suppose when we look at the results of the Forrestal, what's really interesting is that there's no consistent relationship between winning the Forrestal at Under-14 and being a successful minor team three or four years later, or a successful senior team in the future. So actually, the Tony Forrestal is really good at figuring out who's the best under-14 team in the country. But might that sort of tournament or outcome might not be the best stepping stone to help young players see the, uh, fulfill their potential into the future, or young team, or teams fulfill their potential in the future. But why is that the case? Why is, what happens competition when we use it with this sort of outcome focus on the pathway? So when we use competition as a coach, it drives our behaviours. So if I'm using a competition to figure out who's the best team in the country, that's going to drive some of my coaching behaviours. It's going to drive who I pick. So generally what I'll do is I'll pick the best under 14 kids in my club for Failure or in my county for Tony Forrestal. That means I'm probably biased towards relatively older, relatively more mature, or relatively better players, and they get into the team and get lots of action. Of course, on the flip side of that, it means I deselect or I don't select the relatively younger, relatively less able, and relatively more mature or less mature players. They don't get into the teams, so they don't get these learning opportunities. As a coach, it also drives my coaching behaviours. It means I might coach with certain tactics because that might win this tournament. I be, might be very didactic, very authoritarian, very this is how we're going to do it. Players follow that recipe and are successful there. 
But that sort of coaching mightn't be what those players need for what's going to happen next month, next season, next year. So one of the things we have to think about is that we're coaching the player of tomorrow, especially when we're dealing with underage players. So how are we going to use coaching effectively to drive those behaviours that we want our players to see next week, next month, next year, and on into the future? And we see this evidence everywhere. So there's lots of really interesting research coming out of UL, for example, that talks about the lack of relationship between being a really successful under 14, 15, and 16-year-old track and field um, runner or, or field eventer, and the conversion of that into senior success. What we see, kind of like our super champs and almosts, is that actually being very good young and being successful very young has no relationship to being very successful later on. Some interesting work coming out of sports like football and rugby that shows that players that actually come into the pathway later are more likely to stay there and thrive than players that are selected early. Perhaps because they've experienced some of this rocky road, some of this turbulence, and have some of the psychological skills, the stuff that happens above the neck, that allow them to thrive later on. But of course, competition is vital to what we do. We're competitive on the pitch, we need, and competition is an important element of our sports. But the key question, therefore, is not not to use competition, but to how do we use the current competition structures effectively to drive people's development? At the moment, they drive our coaching. We coach in certain ways because we want to win competitions. But what we want, I would like you to think about is how you as a coach can use competitions to drive the development of the players. So of course, competition can support development. But that might mean, especially for those of us working at underage levels, that we change our mindset or our coaching philosophy around how we use that competition. So we might say that we want competition to be fun. We want it to have a developmental focus that is fun. Now, that's a really difficult word, because fun isn't just throwing in the ball and letting the kids play and Friday night lights or whatever it is. It's not just letting them be active. When we talk to young players and we say, tell us about the most fun you have playing sport, they tell us about activities and coaching that's challenging, that's stretching, that's hard work that they have to invest in, that's interesting, that they're, they're learning something in. So if we want to keep the pool of talent as wide as possible, we have to make it as fun as possible for as many people as possible. We need to keep the squads big, give people opportunities to play. The second thing that competition does is it has to improve people's movement and perceived competence. So if competition, and often we, we use lots of different types of matches as part of our competition pathway, how are, we, how are players learning during those matches? How are they getting lots of time to learn, to make mistakes, and to practice? Often competition, if we're driving the winning as an important thing, the players are too afraid to make mistakes. They don't try new things, they don't learn. They stay very comfortable, they stay within, within the, their own bubble, but actually, are they improving? Are they getting better as a result of that competition? We want to think about how we can use competition to improve players' confidence, how good they are, and their perceived confidence, how good they think they are. We also want to make sure that competition gives lots of touches, lots of actions, lots of decisions, because they're the type of behaviours you want your young players to have in the future. If I, if I as leash under 16 manager go down and play Wexford under 16s and I just play my 15 players against their best 15 players and the other 15 players that go down on the bus don't get a touch, don't get a decision, don't get an action, I'm not necessarily giving everyone a, a, a good uh, developmental opportunity. So I have to think how I can structure my competitions so more players get better experiences for longer within my pathway. The other thing competition needs to do is it has to drive autonomy and independence. For lots of people who work at the senior level of the game, players come into their panel and they bemoan, he can't make a decision, he doesn't take any responsibility, she doesn't know what to do in that situation, she's waiting for someone to tell her what to do all the time. But of course they are if we don't give those young players opportunities to be independent, autonomous and take responsibility on the way up. So we have to let players lead. We have to give them responsibility within the competitions that we structure. And we have to make it variable. We have to play different types of competitions with different types of outcomes. 
with different types of formats against different types of teams with different tactics. We have to make sure that players get exposed to various types of competitions so that they become better players at the end. If you're sitting in this room and you've given up your weekend to come to this coaching conference, I've no doubt that everyone here is a really engaged, enthusiastic coach who wants to do as well as they can. And often, this is preaching to the converted. This is people who are doing the right thing. But there's lots of people out there that you have to convince that this type of competition focus is the right thing. And I came across, across this on Twitter last week. So I had a parent storm off and sit in the car and I had two more private messaged me because I rotate every position. So I have a developmental focus to my, to my competition. Everyone gets on the pitch, everyone gets to play, everyone plays in different positions. I haven't even been home five minutes yet and I've got this. So it was under six, I said a lot of fun, but the parents didn't. Yeah? So here's a coach with a very good developmental focus, gives lots of players opportunities, plays with a, with a long-term vision in mind, but it's the parents he needs to convince that this is the right way forward. So if you're working in your club, in your county, in your structure, it's making sure you bring people on that journey. Think of the parents in the Super Champ slide, making sure they understand why you're doing what you're doing in the way that you're doing it. So what could this look like? If I'm sitting here as a coach, how, and I'm saying, we need to use competition with a developmental focus. We well, need to use competition to make our players better. So when you set up your competition planning and you set up your challenge games and your tournaments and your championships, what would that look like? Well, the first thing is you have to decide what your objective is. What do I want to get out of this, championship, uh, out of this match? If I'm a senior manager, most of the time I want to win, especially in a competition schedule. If I'm an underage manager, I want to win, but actually I want to win doing the right developmental thing. I want to win doing the right thing. If I can win with a developmental focus, that's the golden chalice of underage coaching. Sometimes, though, winning is less important to me. Maybe as an underage coach, I want to test and challenge my players. So I'll actually go and I'll play a team that's way better than me or I'll go and play people out of position, or I'll go and play um, competitions under fatigue, because I want to challenge my players in certain ways and certain, uh, certain aspects of their development, irrespective of the scoreline at the end. It might mean that I want to use competition to develop some behaviours in my players. So, like Laura talked about, I want to talk, develop players who are self-responsible, who, who are autonomous in their behaviours, who take leadership positions. So actually, I'll structure my competition for those behaviours in mind. So as a coach, we, don't, we shouldn't use competition with just the outcome in mind, but we need to start with the end in mind. What do I want to achieve at the end of this competition? And how am I going to judge if I've used the competition appropriately to help my players learn? So a couple of ideas about what that might look like. The first one is that I always say we look at match day or game day as a learning day. Right? It's not the exam. It's not, especially on the pathway towards elite status. I'm using match day as a way to learn, as a, way, as a coach, as a way to learn, and as players to see where they're at. It's almost a temperature gauge. If I'm setting up friendly games, challenge games, I'll often work in collaboration with my opposition. So I'll give them a call and say, James, we're going down to play you next week. This is what I want out of it. This is the type of players I have. Let's set up that day. I work with a little bit with Irish 21 Hockey. They're in Spain at the moment. They're playing a 20, under 23 GB squad that they're getting well beaten by because the outcome of that series of games isn't whether they win or not, but it's developing some of the behaviours and skills that they'll need in the summer in the European Championships. So they're setting up their schedule to get other things out of it, out of it irrespective of winning and losing. I also have to consider the role of the coach. I was doing some coach education a while ago and we were talking about uh, competition structures and changes in competition structures. And in the Q&A afterwards, for the first maybe 10 minutes, the coaches talked and said, but if we do that, how will I know what's happening? How will I know I'm a good coach? How will I know when to make decisions? How will I know how to change players? And it was only in about minute 11, 12 or 13 that the Q&A started to go and talk about what the players will learn, how they're going to engage in it. So how do we use competition to drive players' learning rather than just think about the role of the coach? And it might be that as a coach, I take a step backwards. That players lead the tactical discussion. That players lead the debrief. They may even do some of the substitutions. That they do the halftime talk. 
I teach them how to do it. I set them up with the ability to do it. But on the day, I give them the ownership and the reins. That's really important if I'm setting them up to play out here someday because they can't hear the coach on the sideline. They have to take responsibility for their own development. So giving them some of those opportunities on the way up is really important. And the final one is that we need to, to redefine what winning is, especially at developmental level. It might be as well that I need to think, in, I need to individualize that approach. So if I'm here and I'm working with Kildare under 15s and we're going out to play this team, for John and Paul, here's your goals. Here's what I want you to do today. So here's your individual challenge. Irrespective of the scoreline at the end, here's your job. As a team, here's the objectives that we're going to set for ourselves that we can do that are in our control. So I now start to judge the competition based on things I want to learn and get better at rather than just the outcome. We want to assess against long-term goals. We want to think about what we're doing now as an underage coach has repercussions next week, next year, and down the line when you pass those players up. For lots of us who work with underage coaching, it's the ultimate test of delay gratification. Because if I'm coaching the under 14s, 15s, or 16s, I don't know if I'm successful in 2019, 2020, or 2021. I only know I'm a successful underage coach in five, six, 10 years time when those players are still playing the game. So I have to, as an underage coach on the pathway, think how I use competition for the long term. So the final bit I'll talk about is this idea that coaching is really a decision-making process, right? So if you're a coach, you're sitting or standing at the side of a pitch or in a gym or in a team room, and you have lots of decisions to make about how you do it. And it's the difference between, between being a chef and a cook. So lots of coaches come on coaching conferences or come to coaching days and they want a book of drills or a book of um, techniques about how to coach. Almost like this hello fresh food delivery. Here's loads of your ingredients and here's a recipe. Follow the steps and you'll get a really tasty meal at the end of it. But of course, if you coach like that and you coach like that and you coach like that, the players in front of you are all different. So rather than thinking, this is how I coach. I want you to think of yourself as being a chef. So you have the same box of ingredients, a same toolkit of tools that you use in different ways for different reasons and for different outcomes. So the best coaches in the world have a, have a hand of cards, a toolkit that they use and that they can play different cards to get different behaviors out of their players in different situations. And they test that all the time, like a chef tasting his meals. And they add a bit more salt or they turn up the heat or they simmer the soup to get the results that they want. And the key, be the key beyond this is that we have to, as coaches, think about principles before methods. Why are you coaching in the way that you're coaching? Not necessarily just how you're coaching. What are the, under, the principles that underpin really good developmental coaching on the pathway? So for the last few years, um, I've been working with Leinster GA and acknowledgement to Alan Mulhall and James Devan and Shane Flanagan in Leinster, who've over the last few years come up with what we've called the Thuris Coach Education Programme that reflects a lot of what we've talked about today. And Thuris, as you know, is the Irish word for journey. And what we're saying, coach education is a journey. And actually, the destination is way off in the distance because people are always trying to get there. But on the Thuris program, what we're saying is that coach, coaching on the pathway for young players is an absolutely vital ingredient to, to long-term success. And instead of focusing on methods, how people coach, the real focus of the Thuris program is on five key principles that should underpin all our coaching in every situation. So it might be that I'm coaching the under sixes in my nursery, or Laura's coaching Westmead minors, or John is coaching uh, Dublin seniors. The same sort of principles underpin good coaching, irrespective of the situation. And in Thuris, we've got five. The first one is this testing and challenging. Think of the rocky road. All players should be challenged to improve at their level. That's difficult because we're a team sport and we have 30, 40 players on a match or in a, in a squad. But how can we challenge all players within our coaching, within our training and competition to get better? The second principle is that it understands that the player is at the centre of the game. It's an athlete-centred approach. That we put this player at the centre of our decision-making process. Why am I doing this to make that player better or to make the experience more enjoyable and effective? The third or says it should resemble the game. Everything should be game-based. That doesn't mean everything is a game, 
but it should be related to the game that you want to play or that you want to play in the future. The fourth one is that all players should be involved all the time. Lots of touches, lots of decisions, lots of actions. That's really difficult because sometimes if I'm playing a competition, I'm going to keep my strongest team on because that will win. In the long term, though, I need to make sure that I'm giving a good developmental experience to lots, a broad base of those players. Because actually, I'm, especially young players, I'm very unsure about who those ones with the most potential are. If we think about when we make lots of decisions about selection, think of the Tony Forrestal, it happens right around maturation and puberty. So we're likely to pick players who look like the real deal, because they're big, strong, fast, and physically mature at 14, but they've reached puberty, they've reached maturation, and are unlikely to get any bigger, stronger, or faster. At the same time, we're likely to deselect others because of that, and we don't give them the coaching opportunities to get better. So we have to make sure that we involve as many players as, for as long as possible in the best way that's possible. And finally, the last principle is that it should be an enjoyable, developmentally appropriate, and holistic GA experience. That means when I go to an under sixes, an under tens, an under 14, or a senior session, they should look different. I was at a, G, uh, a GA pitch over the summer and I was watching the under sevens train and the coach, very well meaning, had them lined up doing quad stretches and stretching their neck. I'm not sure the last time an under seven pulled a quad in the, in the warm up to their session, but that's what he saw the seniors doing the Tuesday night before. So we have to make sure that it's developmentally appropriate, that it meets the needs of the player in front of us. So Laura's gonna come and she's gonna kind of reflect briefly on what we've talked about and her good, her bad, and her what I would have done differently. Anya asked me just to have a reflect back through kind of my experiences through different coaches over the years and have a look at, I suppose, the good, the bad, and what I would do differently. Um, I suppose there's a few things there. It's culture and unity in the coaches that I've worked with. Um, I mentioned there earlier that in 2006, we had this young coach that came in and probably turned things around within the, within the county for us. Um, at the time, the team really didn't hold any weight among players. Um, and he really set, he set out the standards of what it meant and what it was expected of to be an inter-county player. Um, he put a pride back in the jersey and, you know, it no longer became Westmead, no longer became just a drop-in team whenever you felt like it, but it was a team that you would commit to and, you know, above all others in your life, that that was to take the priority for you. Um, because at the moment, at that time, it was just not a priority at all. On top of that as well, around the time, we had two very competitive clubs within the county that were probably at rivalry with each other and were really hampering the development of the county team. Girls didn't necessarily want to play on the team with other girls. Um, it also probably affected our unity as a team because we just, things were very fractured in the dressing room. And that's one thing that Kenny came in and he really worked at was uh, breaking down those uh, barriers um, every drain, training session I remember during that year, he would set up um, like a, just a developmental like get to know you kind of drill and uh, team building. And unknowns to ourselves, you know, something happened that we really didn't expect and we kind of found out that actually we actually really like each other. Um, and that's something, you know, that kind of sense of unity and togetherness is something that really held through all the years through SME. There was a core group of players that stuck together and stuck at it simply because of that purpose. Um, and that's probably what drew me back to the team when I came back from rugby was I actually really enjoy playing with that group of girls and I couldn't wait to get back to it again. Um, a simple thing is organisation, I suppose. Uh, um, for so many years, you know, you'd be expected to give your commitment to this team, but you didn't know when you'd be training, for how long you'd be training, where you'd be training, uh, and what the season looked like. So how are you expected to give commitment um, when you don't know what it looks like, and how are you meant to have, find a balance with life when you don't know what it looks like? So I remember going into the rugby program was one of the first things that struck me, is that they literally handed me an Excel spreadsheet, and it was an eight-month program. Now, that might be, seem a bit excessive, but it literally detailed every day that I was training, what I was doing on that training day, and what it looked like. So every contact that I had with that seven squad for eight months was there. So it allowed me to build a life around that. So what would my work schedule look like around that? Um, what you know, family time could I get in around that? Can I make that you know, cousin's wedding in two months' time or not? But like when you're expecting players and parents to give commitment, you need to show them what it's going to look like. Um, the last thing, I suppose, is giving feedback and communication. I've been in dressing rooms over the years where coaches have come in and slammed the door and et players for the performance that has just gone on at halftime or just previously. You know, we didn't 
carry out the game plan to how it should have been carried out. You know, and you're being told everything that went wrong, but not being told how to correct the situation. Um, and playing basketball and playing sevens rugby, I suppose, with the quick time out or with rugby, you have a woman a turnaround in the half time. Feedback needs to be very quick, very critical, um, and very concise. So, you know, instead of saying they've had the ball for the last 25 minutes and you might as well have a camera in your hand and take pictures of them, well, thanks very much. No, you need to get to that rook, you know, much sooner. You need to get to the breakdown and secure the ball much quicker. You need to work in your pods at three. So giving very concise feedback and information on how to problem solve without ta and taking the emotion out of it for the player. One of the things that I think is really important is that often we look at the players that come through our pathway and we wonder why they haven't something. We wonder why they're not committed. We wonder why they're not skillful enough. We wonder why they don't take responsibility. And I think this quotation is really important. So when a flower doesn't bloom, you fix the environment in which it grows and not the flower. So as coaches, we have to consider the foundation of the, of the coaching that young players get to make sure we give them the opportunity to bloom. So thank you very much for your, your attention. Happy to take uh, questions up here afterwards if anyone has anything to, um, to query or comment on. Thank you very much.